Uh, we're back. We're live. This is a given Thursday, and this is Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel, and on the other end, we have Carlos Juarez, and he's in Mexico City today. Hi, Carlos. Hello, Jay. Aloha. It's great to connect with you and obviously try to make some sense of this rather remarkable uh, global protest movement that uh, is just unfolding. Uh, and so we're here to talk about that. How do we make sense of this uh, pretty mass? Um, so interesting. Globally... You know, when we were yes, shaping yes. the show, I wrote to you and said, Carlos, what would you like to talk about? And I didn't see your email to me. And I suggested we talk about global protest. But then I didn't see your email to me, which exactly said the same thing. <laughs> Jay, what do you think? We're we should talk about global protest <laughs> brainwaves. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You, we're in sync. And of course, yeah, I, I mean, it is just remarkable. All, many continents uh, everywhere from Lebanon to Chile to Barcelona, Algeria, uh, obviously continued uh, in Hong Kong now for months. And while each of these places has their own maybe particular spark or issue in their own context, uh, we want to maybe tease out and think about, are there some commonalities, some common issues? Um, and here, uh, let me suggest there are certainly a few things that weave through a lot of these various uh, protest movements. We'll, we'll discuss them individually on one hand, but what are some common issues? Well, I would tell you a few. One of them is inequality, uh, a growing frustration everywhere, uh, more awareness of deepening inequality, and, and it takes different forms in different places. Maybe closely related to that is just the issue of corruption and, and awareness of, of a lot of uh, you know, public officials and, and, and more, you know, maybe openness to this uh, and, and help facilitated by a lot of social media that helps to disseminate this. Uh, as well, we see in some cases the very critical issue of political freedoms that are being challenged. Maybe either, either you can see it as steps back in terms of democracy or just concerns in a place like Hong Kong for months now, uh, concerns over what, you know, what role Beijing wants to maybe tighten the screws on them, uh, sparked by an extradition issue, but now taking on a different level. Uh, and maybe lastly, although not connected to most of these, but in a few cases, we saw in the past month, a groundswell of protests related to climate change, environmental issues, again, driven mostly by very young, uh, young protest movements. Uh, of course, uh, Greta Thunberg, the young uh, Swedish mm. girl who uh, mobilized literally last month, millions of people to a, a global climate strike. Uh, and uh, in many ways, demanding urgent action, not just protesting, but calling on governments to do something. But back to the outset, and maybe I'll, I want to turn to you for maybe helping un unravel some of the questions, but this question of inequality, on one hand, it's as much a criticism of globalization, globalism, because while it has brought prosperity and benefits and interconnectedness, I think a, a growing sense that there's a small elite that seems to be garnering most of those benefits. And uh, I'm looking, for example, at the case in Santiago, Chile, a quite dramatic uh, set of uh, protests, violent, uh, destructive, some of the infrastructure there. And, you know, it was sparked by a rise in price of, uh, let's say, the public transport, the metro. But it's a lot deeper than that. It really is a sense that here's a country that for decades has been the model in Latin America, very, you know, high growth rates and, you know, maybe getting close to exiting the developing world status. But in fact, uh, also an awareness that it's deeply, uh, uh, I think data showing it's got deep levels of inequality, income inequality. Mm. So those benefits are, are concentrated. Mm. And today here we are seeing in the streets of Santiago, uh, visions of what we didn't see since, gosh, the days of Augusto Pinochet in, in the seventies, uh, tanks in the street, tear gas, uh, military, you know, and so we've got a picture here, that's a site there of uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, uh, quite a dramatic uh, set of issues and the government now trying to step back and negotiate, but with the facing a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, then we can turn to another picture, um, other side of the world in, in, in uh, Barcelona, Spain, uh, we've got a, a massive groundswell there. Now that's a particular situation. It's a, obviously a protest against uh, the uh, recent uh, jailing of some of the separatist leaders of Catalonia, the Catalan Republic uh, that they're seeking. Uh, they were basically nudged out by the government. This is also a polarized uh, environment there uh, because it deeply divided in Spain, whether they should provide a, autonomy or, or full independence. Uh, and of course, uh, even in Barcelona, deep division there, but very emotional. Uh, then uh, we can turn to another one. And we saw just in these past days, dramatic uh, protest movement in, in Lebanon, in Beirut, a picture here in the downtown square, hundreds of thousands of people, basically, again, uh, challenging uh, the, the situation there, uh, a revolt over the government taxation on something as simple as what's up, these, uh, you know, social media that are so used everywhere in the world. Uh, and that was yet the spark, because here again, Lebanon, a, a country that now, you know, has a very complex social fabric, uh, came out of a civil war decades ago. And today, you have a 
uh, maybe awareness that there's uh, the richest 3,000 people in this country earn 10% of the national income. So they're doing quite well, the political leaders, a lot of corruption benefiting themselves, and the public, you know, the public is finding, you know, economic scarcity, uh, difficulty getting basic, you know, uh, electricity and water, uh, and yet here's a country that has wealth and, and has a very wealthy elite, uh, but maybe through, again, more awareness through social media, a growing frustration about that. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the final, we've got another picture, I think, of Lebanon. This is, I'm sorry, this next final picture here uh, shows us in London, where, of course, we've had at different times uh, rising protests and maybe uh, both ways about the Brexit drama that continues to play out. That's a separate story we'll maybe revisit here in a couple of weeks. But what I wanted to show this picture, because it underscores the youth uh, population uh, that is really getting very angry and frustrated. And, and again, these protest movements, um, even we're not seeing them on the headlines today, but the recent developments in uh, last months in Paris, France, uh, and other parts of France, uh, the so-called yellow vests, uh, it takes on a different uh, dimension. That is, uh, you know, the whole system, the corruption, the inequality, uh, or maybe political freedom. So there you have it. It's a, it's a complex set of issues. Maybe as we move ahead, what are some common issues beyond that? Uh, and I wonder, maybe let me let you... Well, I'd like questions. to add to your list, Carlos. I mean, we we, we started um, a couple of months ago, a little more, with, uh, with the Mauna Kea protests. A lot of people, mm -hmm. for a small state like Hawaii, a lot of people yeah. were up there uh, committing themselves, investing their, their time, their energy into protesting the telescope. Uh, which is a it's hard to justify in, in, a, in a progressive analysis but there they are um, and then we find yeah. right now today i don't know if you follow all of this but we have two uh, uh two uh, wind uh, wind turbine protests going on two two of them in oahu and people are out there and i if, if you had a look at the faces you might find some of the same faces from the mauna kea mm -hmm. protests um yeah. and they're they're trying to stop and they're you know borderline of violence. You know, a lot of people have been arrested. Uh, they're trying to stop the, uh, the, the transportation of these turbines uh, to be used uh, in wind farms. Um, and that's right here. The little tiny Hawaii has got, you know, yeah. three major protests and maybe more coming. I suspect there will be more coming. And then, you know, then just a couple of days ago, you look at, look at Congress. Congress already has a protest inside of Congress. <laughs> yeah. That's got to be a first. That's never happened before. And these guys are think, making uh, like a, go ahead. Let me, let me correct you, Jay. I think it's not a protest. I think it's a circus, a strange, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but indeed, yeah, I mean, I may be a different form of, of protest and disobedience. Uh, the, we're speaking of the Republican uh, uh, protest uh, trying to hold off the impeachment inquiry. Uh, well, now, I, one I, of the I things, three of course, possibilities yeah. here, Carl. Let me throw them at you and see how you yeah, react. Yeah, yeah. Now, number one is, um, you know, it reminds me of a book called Smart, Smart Mob, or Smart Mobs, back in around 2000, 2001 or two, by a guy named Reinhold, as I remember. And he, he, uh, he wrote about uh, mobs that uh, gathered in, uh, in large squares in Europe and, um, and would protest something. And, uh, and, and of course, he connected it with the internet. In, in those days, it was just email, not social media, but um, you, yeah. couldn't, you couldn't have a mob um, descend on a city square, uh, you know, where, which was empty a minute before, and now it has 100,000 people. You couldn't do that without some kind of electronic gathering mechanism. Um, and of course, we're way beyond that now. And likewise, all the photographs you've shown of these large crowds, uh, and I suppose I could go back to Tinnaman too, back, back when, that was 1989 or 90. 30 um, years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that you can't, you can't have a big crowd um, come down in one place so quickly without communicating with them. So what we have is um, we have a, a social media has got to be involved in every one of these things, okay? And uh, then of course they're playing to the media. They're, they're they're doing it so they can be reported on social media and conventional media both. Um, they you know yeah. they want to have some some face, they want some attention, and they and they get it. And, and finally, yeah. it seems to me that we live in a time where we, we have global culture points. This is a global culture point. Is if you're unhappy about something, uh, you know, get out in the street, make your make yourself known. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of viral and it goes around the world. And uh, you know, it's uh, even though they're not all listening to our show together, Carlos, I know there'll be more of this. And if we yeah. if we regroup next week, there'll be another few of them. And after that, another few of them, it's almost like 
you know, the virus is affecting the functionality of these countries, um, and they go dysfunctional because of, of the protests. Um, I have other theories too, but I just want to throw that at you and see what you think. Well, I mean, you're touching on what is really, I think, a, a thread passing through all of these, and it is the use of social media, these new technologies. They are a double-edged sword. On one hand, they help us to create awareness, to describe and discuss, you know, things, hold, you know, officials accountable, and, uh, and, and of course, mobilize logistically, uh, get people, like you said, into the square through social media. Yet the other side is uh, we've also seen clearly again and again uh, the manipulation, the, you know, the ability of, of, you know, gosh, anybody practically, it could be a kid in a garage in Cleveland who's got some capacity to uh, infiltrate, uh, get data. Uh, we're seeing, I mean, even today, I think uh, Zuckerberg of, of uh, Facebook is testifying in Congress uh, and being challenged about, you know, uh, what what is the role of these uh, media, uh, you know, entities. So there's the social media aspect. And it, again, it's a mixed blessing. And I, I can I can remember way back in the early days where we were of the idea, this is going to democratize the world. It's going to help, you know, mobilize. Yes, there is that. Uh, and yet there's the other darker side, uh, the sinister use. I also think it reflects maybe the challenge and the frustration with democracy. Democracies both, you know, uh, require uh, information and the participation and, and citizen engagement, but they can also, you know, majorities can sometimes be cruel or, or democracies can lead to outcomes often that are challenged and, and more and more we see that. Uh, and again, the use of, of media just to shape public opinion, to distract public opinion, to, uh, you know, put so much out there that it just muddies the waters. And, and, you know, we also have more and more research showing us that people are more inclined to simply look at and read the things that reinforce their biases. They're not getting like, as you well know, a generation ago, we had several decent, good sources of information and you could, everybody was talking the same dialogue, reading the same information. Now, uh, especially more and more with the polarization, you're just looking at one angle, one perspective, and quickly refusing to accept the other side. And so you've got different realities going on there. Uh, and facts that are facts, but they can be seen very differently, uh, very right. frustrating for those of us to, you know. Uh, we're, we're, but we're, as you we're, said, you know, the common denominator here is that people are dissatisfied with the status quo. Yeah. And that means Absolutely. they're dissatisfied with the government as it exists. They don't think the government yeah. is listening to them. They don't think the government is doing right, the right thing by yeah. them. And part of the problem, I think, is education. They don't understand the way governments can or should work. And it is especially poignant in this country where government is representative and we're supposed to have all these checks and balances. <clears throat> and we're supposed, we are part of the government. The government is part of us. We're all together in this thing and in our republic and our democracy. It reminds me of Ben Franklin coming out of Liberty Hall after the, uh, the Constitution was, it was written. And uh, mm -hmm. a woman was waiting for him. It was in secret. A woman was waiting for him outside. And she said, uh, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of a, a government are we going to have? And he said, and I quote, <clears throat> he said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. So it requires yes. education. It requires an effort on the part of everybody in the social compact. And I suggest to you, Carlos, that the social compact here and elsewhere is breaking down. People don't no, understand no. it's a compact and that they have obligations and, you know, continue and to improve and to participate, engage in government, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it underscores the idea of this notion, well, democracy, it's imperfect, it's problematic, but it's really one of the best options we have for, you know, addressing questions of fairness and equality and justice. And yet people are frustrated because it, it, democracy doesn't seem to be working. Uh, it, it, it's also not the thing that you just get it and you put it on the shelf and there you have it and it keeps working. You have to continually be uh, fighting for it, addressing, you know, grievances and, and issues. Moreover, leaders, I think, uh, you know, again and again, we see evidence that obviously power corrupts and, and, and leaders everywhere and, and even in democratic uh, systems find themselves abusing power, maybe distorting, you know, information and, 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 uh, and doing anything to stay in office. Uh, it becomes embarrassing where at the end of the day, politicians are only interested in their political survival and not, not the public interest or, 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 you know, values that interest maybe society. So uh, that's a big challenge for all of us. Uh, so we're seeing it, it's under the radar, it's being exploded at local levels. Uh, it's, and yet there's also this maybe growing awareness of when you see things happening in other places, it, it probably provides added incentive. It mobilizes people sure, to sure. Either, either emulate, look at tactics, maybe you know harness the media attention. Uh, so here we are speaking about all these things happening simultaneously and yes, they have their own story, but they're also 
There's some common connected. denominators. You know, and don't yes. forget the fun factor. Uh, when I say the fun factor, I mean, uh, you know, a fellow turns to his girlfriend and says, hey, it's Saturday night. There's a protest downtown. Why don't we spend a little, let's, let's not go. go to the movies tonight. Let's go to the <laughs> yeah, protest. Yeah, yeah. And I remember yes. uh, they, back in the day, I was with uh, Hawaii Public Radio, and there was a protest. I don't know if you remember, there's a protest at University of Hawaii around UARC, UARC, uh, University Affiliated Research. Yes, yes. It was for the benefit yeah, of, of, of the military. military. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So they, they occupied course. McLean's office. Uh, the, the kids mm -hmm. went there and they sat there and they had their potato chips and left the wrappers all around. It yeah. was really a mess. And McLean left, you yeah. know, he wasn't there, but the yeah. news, newspapers were there. So I sent an intern up there to report mm -hmm. back. And he went and he, with a little yeah. tape recorder. And he went, he went down there and he, I told him, ask one question. <laughs> ask everybody in the room one question. The question was, why are you here? You know, and most of them had no answer to that. You yeah. know, I, I, I yeah, like, like girls, game. you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's free pizza or something. Uh, well, actually, I think the, the protest yesterday, I, I was reading a description of the Republicans in Congress where they brought in pizzas, eventually Chick-fil-A ch uh, chicken, and eventually when the food ran out, okay, people got tired and moved on, and uh, after five hours, they left. Well, food. you know, let, let me take us uh, to one last picture that we have, because, of course, uh, the, the drama that's been unfolding in Hong Kong now for many, many, many weeks, literally months, uh, of course, it, it, it was sparked by uh, concerns over the extradition. Uh, uh, a law that would extradite criminals to mainland China, but now it's taken on other things. But I show you here a chart uh, that came out recently in the social media, Hong Kong protest gear, summer 2019, a very sophisticated look at how basically, uh, you know, you've got these heavy uh, construction helmets to protect against bullets and tear gas. You've got heat resistant gloves to throw back the canisters. Uh, these are pretty well sophisticated, organized, and interestingly in Hong Kong today, it's almost like you said, it's almost become ritualized uh, where uh, you've got very many layers of society. You know, the, the, the nurses and doctors are all engaged. They, you know, some of them sleep in the day and they work at night to deal with uh, protesters that are injured. Uh, you've got, you know, taxi drivers mobilizing people. So it's almost a very sophisticated logistical uh, story. And again, just with Hong Kong, you can see these are not the protesters of, you know, past years or maybe China in the 1930s or 40s. Here they are now carrying out, you know, very specialized and, and, and you know, probably people making business from this, the umbrella protesters. as, as, as Yes, you know, of course. Very so that brings us to, to a very interesting question. You know, in the case of China, the the the, um, the, um, uh, the, the PRC has been uh, sort of waiting them out. They haven't done anything really violent or grotesque. Um, there are complaints about what they've done, what the police have done in Hong Kong, but you know, it's not like Tiananmen. Um, and yeah, yeah. and you, and you you wonder, okay, that seems like a good strategy, uh, except it hasn't worked yet because the protesters are still out there with all this gear and increasingly sophisticated. Um, you know, methodologies. But, but what, what does a government do? You mentioned a number of places where we have, you know, pretty robust protests. And in each place, uh, you know, there's the possibility of giving in. Um, that certainly exists in Mauna Kea and in the other, uh, you know, protests here in Hawaii. One of which I forgot to mention is the, is the Sherwood Forest protest, where they want to, the city wants to build a park. There's a protest against building a park. Uh, it's hard to believe, no, but no, bad idea. It's a bad <laughs> idea, yeah. So um, anyway, my, my point though is one one possibility is to hear the protesters as if they were like testifying in your legislative proceeding and listen to them and act on them and and somehow make it possible to uh, you know accede to their demands or find a way to soften the problem they describe. Um, there are other yeah. possibilities too. There's rubber bullets, there's truncheons, there's tear gas, and there's real bullets. Um, and I think we, we see different approaches in different cities where these protests are yeah. popping up. Do you have any thoughts about what the ideal response is? Is there one ideal response or is it to have to suit the, suit the situation or what? Yeah, I don't know. I'd be reluctant to say there's a, you know, there's a one approach that's going to solve this because, again, based on the political culture and the content, I mean, look at after the Tiananmen Square 30 years ago, China wants to be very careful not to find itself, you know, cracking down on those protesters. Uh, and yet in other places, yeah, it, it, it may take on different forms. I think in the end, it has to sit down and say, 
civil society that is, and, and the strategy of taking a draconian hard line, it carries a heavy risk of, of legitimacy for the leaders. Obviously, the, the scrutiny and the use of, you know, these uh, cell phone technologies now that can put immediately onto the, into the news, you know, any, any use or extraordinary uh, measures. It is, uh, I think, the real solution is you've got to confront them and, 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 and come down and, and, and dialogue. Uh, there's no other way. What we're seeing in many places is, of course, a reversal of whatever sparked it, but that's not sufficient. And these protests go on, maybe more other things like, okay, they now moving on to more, uh, looking at issues like complete universal suffrage, uh, an independent inquiry into the police brutality. And so it, like, it, it takes on a life of its own, different dimensions. Uh, it may have started with one initial thing, but, uh, uh, and yet at the same time, there does come a point where, you know, and, and for the authorities, you know, if you wait it out, if you reach a point of exhaustion, and be there. there's no easy answer to that. Ultimately, think the legitimacy of, of the governments, they, they've got no option but to sit down and, and talk and, and open a dialogue and give a voice to these, uh, you know, very powerful social yeah. movements coming from below. Uh, uh, however, legitimate, maybe some of them very much, maybe others that are spark. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's it becomes a, a real problem um, if you don't do the right thing, because, you know, the crowd yeah. can get worse. And while the crowd is in the streets, the economy of that city, that country, usually it's in a capital city, you know, um, yeah. is, 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 uh, is, is declining. Um, and take Venezuela, for example. You know, there was a report recently about how the Venezuela, um, you know, medicine is down, food is down, water is down, the economy is down, and he's not doing anything to deal with them. Um, and, and the result is the, 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 whole, the whole country is, is dysfunctional, and there will be long-term problems come out of this no matter what happens. Uh, there's no That's good right. answer at the end of the road. Uh, so he must yeah. deal with them if he wants to save the country. Yeah, no, and I think that's the challenge that we see. Uh, the, the, these are no simple, easy solutions. They're complex issues. There are root causes that can't be solved immediately. But obviously, people demand. They want, you know, they want some heads to roll. They want some uh, uh, better, you know, governance. Uh, they want uh, leaders that are going to be more responsive. And so I think, again, it, it will vary by different societies. I mean, some places have maybe a tradition of more open, or even a place like France. I mean, for France, protest is ingrained in their uh, MO. And, and so, and yet these most recent ones, uh, those that we've mentioned, have taken on a different dimension, more driven by this economic imperative, uh, the frustration of inequality that seems to be just so pervasive. Uh, and, uh, and that anxiety, again, it, it, it festers, it lingers. And look at the young new generation today growing up in this, uh, a world of uncertainty, of, of, of chaos, deeply interdependent, but also that same interdependence means that the, the, the anger, the protest, the frustration is also, in some ways, a global issue that, uh, that, that permeates yeah. every well, let, me, let me return to something that uh, we started out with, namely social media, because that evokes uh, Facebook and uh, Zuckerberg testifying right now, and, <clears throat> and it evokes uh, Cambridge Analytica, and it evokes what happened in the 2016 election. <clears throat> and, uh, and, what, and what presumably, uh, according to Mueller, is still happening and will happen in the uh, 2020 election. Um, and so, um, you know, we know that the Internet Research Agency, operated by Putin, uh, has the ability, with the help of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, uh, you know, to divide. In fact, uh, Facebook, um, you know, was involved in the Brexit vote, and they divided people. There was also a, a, some country in the Caribbean, uh, you got to look at this movie called the, the Great Hack, where some, uh, mm. some whistleblowers came out of Facebook and told you what, what they yes. had done, or rather Cambridge Analytica, and told you what mm. they had done and how they had a party yeah. each time they, they <laughs> messed up some country's election. Um, so it's possible to divide people right to the point of messing up an election and creating this kind of, you know, the divisiveness. And so, it, you know, it's an, it's an inevitable suspicion for me that somebody is doing this from far away. I mean, could it be, yeah. Carlos, could it be a, one great big coincidence that, you know, you can identify half a dozen cities that are all in flame, um, you know, yeah. or, or could it be that somebody is actually uh, lighting the tinder here and, and creating the argument, no? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, and, and it leads to, again, a lot of the concern and maybe, you know, in some circles, conspiracy theories that take it to a different level. Uh, also, I think what it underscores is that for government officials in every place, all these places, they really have to be uh, quite aggressive and try to be one step ahead because uh, if you're missing the boat, if you're not engaged, uh, you can easily be manipulated, taken advantage of. And yet there's no easy way around doing that either. I mean, uh, governments, I guess what I'm saying there is they, they have to both be vigilant, uh, try to address and, and look at the this proliferation of, you know, fake news, uh, bad news, polarizing news. How do you respond? I mean, uh, I, I can only say, and I don't know this issue in great detail, that you really need to have people who understand how to get in and, and, and get in there quickly and, and and help shape that narrative. Unfortunately, that that's one of the roles that the media has always been an important, maybe, uh, I guess, tool that governments need. They needed to defend their policies, to put out their information. Obviously, they could manipulate it as well, and that's the other concern. But failure to engage or be part of the process will, I think, leave governments more and more weakened and, and, and the, the narrative will be shaped by others with, you know, with different motives, different intentions. You know, you're talking before about what a, what a government might do in order to soften a protest somehow. I mean, either vigilate or, or, or try violence, um, all kinds of things all across the spectrum. But one possibility, I think, that uh, very few governments have actually tried is to get on the circuit, on the social media circuit and try to explain yeah. what is really happening here. Talk, talk to the same people who are getting the divisive messages and give them a different message. Give them a, you know, a message which will help them understand. For uh, some reason, I don't, think, I don't think the U.S. government does that. But of course, the yeah. U.S. government well, is in shambles right now, so we, we can't really <laughs> count for that now. But other places, yeah? But let me do, let me maybe clarify that. I mean, the, the U.S. government does, and maybe not. I'm not speaking here about Donald Trump and his tweets. But the reality is, for example, around the world, our diplomatic uh, posts, our embassies and consulates, they have people who are focused and dedicated to this uh, public diplomacy, helping connect with you know the communities they're in, and through social media, shape the message, the narrative, to put out uh, basically uh, a perspective that, you know, maybe trying to clarify or what have you. And and I, I'm, you know, many of my own former students who work in this foreign service, the diplomacy, are engaged in that, trying to, again, you, you have no option but to do that. And, and it means being with the people. It means meeting with, you know, uh, student movements, social movements, uh, you know, uh, NGOs, uh, to put out a message of maybe clarifying things that are absolutely false or off the mark and maybe providing otherwise good information for everybody. So it's happening. It's happening at the micro level. And again, uh, across our diplomatic uh, service, uh, I, I know that for sure. Obviously, other countries maybe are also trying to deal with it in different ways, some more successful than others. Uh, most of what we see is not a lot of success. Instead, it seems to be driven by uh, uh, I guess, you know, interests that are not clearly defined or, or the darker perspective, you know, that we have people manipulating it from uh, this, uh, uh, what, what was the name internet you called it? Internet Research this, uh, Agency. Internet Research Agency, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. With, with ties there. Uh, even here in Mexico uh, this past year, they had quite a drama play out with uh, a revelation that uh, North Koreans were hacking into the banking system here in Mexico. North Korea, again, uh, you know, obviously, uh, they, they're a bizarre country, but they've got expertise enough uh, to put people behind computers to find ways to, who knows, you know, carry out some some uh, you know, sinister uh, interventions there. So yeah, it, it, this is the challenge that we're in. And, and unfortunately, again, for governments, they, they have to be addressing this issue, cybersecurity, cyber uh, warfare, cyber, you know, even just the use of social media to help uh, explain and, and, and promote the uh, you know, the interests or the foreign policy of any country. Well, you know, but the old Chinese phrase keeps coming to mind. We live in interesting times, Carlos. <laughs> yes. And, 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 you know, the yes. thing about it is it's not just academic. It's not just at a distance. It's not just that we're watching the ball game. We are in the ball game, And sooner yes. or later, it's going to affect everyone. So this kind of global protest revolution, you and I have to keep watching, okay? And I hope we can do a show like this again and along the same lines yes. and, and sort of regroup and see what other cities have, have uh, gotten yeah. into the same issue. Well, yeah. thank you, This Carlos. is not going away. Yes. It's not going thank away. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, no. I hope to see you soon. Take care. Enjoy Likewise. Mexico Aloha. City. Aloha. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Arcandios. -bye. <laughs>